very cooperatively made your way over quickly, we'll get to hear the entirety of this panel. But we do want to keep things moving along just because, again, uh, we have definitely packed this day. So I want to introduce very quickly, we're moving into our third session, which is looking at how technology is changing the ability of individuals to engage with campaigns, advocacy, movements. Um, and to introduce the panelists is the moderator, our moderator, Alexander Kautz, who is the chief product officer of Cannibal and, and I quote from his email signature, head product dude at Lincoln Initiative. So Alex is down here from the Bay Area where he fits in as a techie and entrepreneur and also has this ongoing passion for furthering American democracy. So his career is building and scaling startups as a founder, head of product, marketing, and a UX designer. Um, so he has advised all the cool kids, including Disney, ESPN, ABC, Lloyd's Bank of London, the US Congress, individual members of Congress, and various startups on digital strategy. So Alex, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Wow. To I wish I could live up to that, that was really nice. Uh, so the coveted after lunch spot, can everybody hear me? Yeah? Has everyone gotten caffeine? Are you caffeinated or are you in like a salad and salmon coma? Okay, if I do see you falling asleep at some point, I will point you out or like walk into the audience with a mic. So I just want to warn you on that. So before I get into introducing our wonderful panel, and they are really, really impressive folks, uh, I just want to get a show of hands because I think voter registration is something we're going to talk about today and a number of other things. How many of you are registered to vote in America? Okay, that looks like a slight majority. That's good. How many of you registered to vote online? Okay. How many of you registered to vote via mail? Okay. How many of you registered to vote in person? How many of you registered to vote by accident or are unsure of your voting? Oh, nice. <laughs> got one in the back. Tripped and fell into a county office and registered to vote. Nice. So what that shows, so if we did that poll a couple years ago, basically nobody would say that they had registered to vote online. Everybody would be doing mail or in-person registration. Technology is dramatically changing the landscape for how people interact with politics across the spectrum. Voter registration is one example of that, so we're going to talk about some of that stuff today. Uh, and by the way, we, we alluded to it at lunch, but is everyone aware of the rise and fall of Ken Bones? Has everyone been watching that? Yes. Yeah. The fall has been quite spectacular, so if you have a moment today after this panel, during someone else's panel, I highly recommend you Google uh, what the, the fall of Ken Bones, because he's got some very interesting internet history uh, that has now been shared with the world. It's a very exciting time to be in politics. Uh, so, uh, without further ado, I'm going to hand it over actually to the panelists to introduce themselves because they can probably do a much better job than I can. And then we'll run through a couple slides for each of them really quickly to give you a sense of what they're working on and their amazing companies and the things they're doing. Uh, and then we will get into the discussion stuff. Sound good? Yes? Okay, good. All right, good. Uh, so, let's go and do Adam's first. The closest. Hi, everyone, and Pepperdine, thanks so much for having me. I really appreciate the opportunity to be here with you all. Uh, I am the founder and CEO of Citizen Up. We're a hashtag fundraising platform. Essentially what that is is we allow uh, supporters of nonprofits and candidates to instantly contribute to campaigns by simply uh, retweeting a hashtag on Twitter. And that streamlines the reporting process and, of course, the contributing um, process as well. I think we have some slides we're going to go through later on. Yeah, well, we actually can go through them real quick. Oh, I didn't realize that was up there. Okay. I have a laser pointer, so I'm going to use it for two this way. <laughs> Citizen Up? Yeah, so we're on to the, we're probably on to the third one at this point. Yeah, so what separates us from other uh, payment processing uh, applications like PayPal or ActBlue is that we operate in stream on social media. So all the contributors, friends, and family, they're seeing that a contribution is being made and how they can make one themselves. Viral fundraising is what. Um, we want it to be called, <laughs> if you want to call it that. And then uh, back on the last slide was uh, some of our clients. We worked with uh, several political campaigns and worked with the California Democratic Party. Uh, we've done campaigns with a few celebrities, including Brian Cranston from Breaking Bad. And then uh, last slide. And this is a, a little breakdown of how it works. So on the first uh, image, you'll see uh, the specific hashtags, the amount that the nonprofit's asking for. So a user would just retweet that tweet, and they would, uh, if they're signed up for a service, instantly send that money straight to the nonprofit. The nonprofit would get all uh, required reporting information. This is their first time contributing. They'd get a direct message sent right back to them. 
just asking them to complete their contribution similar to any other contribution page used by a candidate today. And then after that, they would just have to retweet on Twitter and they would be able to contribute and all the information would be reported. And that's it. If uh, you're interested in using our service, here's my shameless plug. That's our email and uh, phone number. Thanks. And then my favorite one of our panelists, Jill. Jill and I had a great intro call. <laughs> Thank you. Can everybody hear me if I face the slides? I haven't memorized them. If I do this, can you all hear me? Okay, so I work for Democracy Works. Uh, I'll repeat everything you say into the mic. Okay, <laughs> perfect. Yeah. As I'm saying it, please. <laughs> so I work for Democracy Works, the creators of TurboVote. TurboVote is an online tool that can be used to register to vote, update your address, subscribe to election notifications, and request an absentee ballot. Uh, we, we were launched in 2012. Uh, technically, 2010 is when we started to, um, you know, produce TurboVote, but uh, we're a 501c3, nonpartisan, nonprofit, little background. Uh, most recently, you can go to the next slide. Most recently, I've had the pleasure of working with the TurboVote Challenge, which is a coalition that we launched in March, uh, bringing together nonprofit organizations and corporations around the idea of elevating voting in a nonpartisan way. Uh, so we developed the hashtag turn up the vote. Um, and our two first members were Starbucks and Univision. So um, we've grown to about just over 50 organizations since then. And we're trying to create an echo chamber in which voters are encouraged to vote through different, uh, different brands or different experiences they engage with. Here's some of our partners. Just a little brag moment for, for us here. Some of our faves up here, um, but we love all our children equally. Um, and here's some of the implementations we've seen this year using our tool. Uh, over here on the left is a tweet of a screenshot from Snapchat, if you can keep up there, of The Rock encouraging users to register to vote. If you were to swipe up on that, uh, on that Snapchat, you would be taken to the TurboVote form to register to vote. Uh, they've done that with a few different celebrities, so that's been an exciting implementation for us. Um, on the right is a picture of the Starbucks cup sleeve through their Upstanders campaign, and it's hard to tell, but right here is TurboVote.org. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about Upstanders if a question is asked that it relates to. Um, that's how Starbucks pushed out voter reg this year. Next slide. Here's a few other just examples. University of Chicago, we work, we work with a lot of universities. That's really our bread and butter at TurboVote to encourage students to engage in elections despite the difficulty they have when they're away from home uh, and maybe voting absentee or navigating a new state's process. Um, Univision put a header over on the left, Vota Porto America, um, and they've had some really great engagement. Here's another screenshot of, of uh, Univision's register to vote tool. And then my last slide, last Sunday, Chance the Rapper tweeted about voter registration. So um, all of this just to highlight some of the unique ways that we've been using technology to increase voter registration in some way or another. Nice. We'll hand it over to Jim over here. Now I figured out after three tries how to use it, so. Cool. Hey guys, my name is um, Jim Couples. <coughs> I work for the company Nation Builder and I head up the project runforoffice.org. Um, Run for Office started uh, in good old Oregon where I'm from, and that's because we certainly have a voter turnout problem, but more significantly, you have a candidate turnout problem. Uh, this is actual ballots. In Oregon, we just simply vote by mail, so I get to take a picture of all this. So out of 26 races, uh, 18 were unopposed, or, or no one filed at all four, and then only eight races did you actually have a choice. So I'm always like, I don't care if you get, you know, voter turnout to 100%. You know, if you don't have any choices, what does it really matter? Um, so who runs for office? Pew did a good study on this. This is all why we did this. There's only 2% of Americans who ever run. 40% of the state legislative seats in 2014 were uncontested. And that's crazy. I mean, state legislatures also became a great lab for a lot of um, right-wing state legislatures to do some experimenting. I still love all my right-wing friends. Um, this is what it looks like. The website, you enter your address. It's live right now. 
and you see everything you run for, from the granular to the federal level. And I don't really care about the federal level. I care about the city hall positions. I care about the Castaic Lake uh, Water Agency. I care about the granular stuff, the stuff that's really hard to get. On the site right now is already all federal offices, uh, state executive offices, state legislative offices, and all that stuff's easy. It's stuff's really uh, easy to get to. The hard stuff is the special districts. Um, so it, it tells you what you can run for, the dates, how to get on the ballot. But this is also why we did it, right? This is, this is a beautiful picture of a terrible night, and it's uh, Post Ferguson with Mike Brown. And I bring that up because Ferguson's really interesting. Uh, in 2012, it voted over 80% for President Barack Obama. In March of 2013, they had their municipal elections, and only 11% of the people voted. And they voted in a Republican mayor. But again, it didn't matter if 100% of the people voted, because he was the only one that ran. And there was one black person on the um, Ferguson City Council. Uh, everyone else, the five other council members, the mayor were all white. In a city that's two-thirds black, and uh, overwhelmingly democratic. So the question is, like, you know, why don't those people run? I mean, how do these people sneak in through this door to um, uh, to have these really start their political careers? And uh, we have a we have a pipeline of candidates that's not representative of the wider public. Anyway, after after Mike Brown died and Darren Wilson's life was destroyed, things changed. If you look at the Ferguson City Council right now, it's uh, half African American and. Um, but like, we shouldn't have to have a teenager have a major conflict with the police to get civically engaged on a local level. And there's also one other layer to this, and that's how the city administrator of Ferguson treated its citizens, and it was really a shakedown operation. It's actually a perfect spot for like, conservatives and African Americans to get together. Um, there's a next door city to Ferguson, Beverly Hills, uh, Missouri, they had a, a city of 600 people with 14 cops, and the average citizen uh, was uh, paid $700 in fines in 2014. It's so, like that's you know you care about taxes, like that's a that's a shake now. Um, anyway, a lot of my work lately, I'm, I'm a political science guy, but I've learned a lot of tech, and I do a lot of shapefile work, and that's really interesting because we don't need another civic tech project in Oakland. They're okay. So is San Francisco. Um, what you need it in, you need it in North Dakota. Where is this? Oh, this is Norwood, North Dakota. You go to North Dakota, you know, half the municipalities don't even have websites. So if you're young, you're looking online for information, it's, it's not available, it's not there. Uh, so that's why we do the project, to, to enable people to easily understand what they can run for and how to get on the ballot. Um, if you're interested about that stuff, my email address is down there. And, Feel free to talk to me. I'm also going to put all this uh, data into an open data portal, which we're really psyched about, because those shape files, people will charge you an arm and a leg for them. Um, those political boundary maps that could be geo-referenced. Well, we have amazing uh, interns from USC, UCLA, a lot of schools around here. And those GIS interns have worked with me to digitize a lot of these shape files for the first time. And that's what lets people in like North Dakota see that stuff. Nice. Awesome. Round of applause. So, um, real quick, I'll just give a background on myself, uh, as um, we talked about this kind of before, but so I'm Chief Product Officer at a company called Accountable, which is a consumer application that helps people learn about what their government is doing. So we write non-biased summaries of bills, send you push notifications when things change in Congress so that you can learn about them. We also provide a bunch of professional level tools to politicians and advocacy organizations to facilitate communication between a constituent and their elected representative. We make it embeddable so we can go on different websites. We're doing experiments with large media brands, like some of the ones you had on your uh, slide before, in addition to a lot of advocacy folks that are doing really cool stuff. Uh, so I've been in the civic space for a while. Um, and a while in like the civic tech space means like five years, which might as well be like a thousand years. And civic tech, because civic tech didn't really exist that much, at least from a consumer perspective, a little while ago. Uh, so just curious, how many people in the audience here use some consumer application to learn about what their government's doing that's specific for that purpose. Good. That's amazing. That's incredible. I mean, the things that you're seeing a lot of the panelists talk about here today are things that are meant to not only provide tools to companies that are reaching consumers, but actually reach consumers directly, which is amazing. But when civic tech started, one of the biggest problems was that people that were doing a lot of the hard work didn't actually understand what the end user at the end of the day was actually using that content for. What value were they getting from it? Why do you vote? 
And that's one of the biggest problems that we have in tech. And to a cobbler, every problem needs a new pair of shoes, right? As a technologist, every problem is a tech problem. But in reality, that's not always the case. So one question I wanted to open up to the panelists to kind of kick things off is, why do you think people get civically engaged? Why do they vote? Why do they decide to run for office? What ignites them? You know, I just like to really quick, I think people register to vote. I think people vote according to the candidates. And like the metaphor that I often use is like the Democrats have a restaurant, the Republicans have a restaurant, the Greens and Libs have little ones, but they're all like yelling at the people that don't want to eat at their restaurant. Like, you know, you should love my food. They have terrible candidates. And you're, you don't, the best person for voter registration, there was, or best thing, there was no app. It was Barack Obama. People liked him. They registered. They voted. I totally agree with Jim. I think it's based on whether you connect, have a personal connection with the candidate. And I think social media over the past five years, especially in the past couple years, has just made that so easy for, for candidates like Bernie Sanders, who wouldn't have had a chance 10 years ago to connect with so many people. Just his campaign has done a great job of utilizing video to, to get all around the United States in a way that they wouldn't have been able to do because it would have cost millions of dollars to get those kinds of ad buys before. I feel like that personal connection drove a lot of people, millennials, right, right. To, to get out and get involved in this past election. Yeah, echoing definitely uh, connection with candidates. I know, you know, for me, my initial civic involvement came from the fact that I am come from a family just full of veterans all the way back to the Revolutionary War. So that's, that's kind of my first, uh, and I think a lot of people can say that, you know, why did you vote in your first election or what's your first memory of an election? And we can we can maybe attach an emotional experience to that. Uh, I think when we reflect on that question, we can also reflect on why why don't people engage? And, and I think that comes down to a lot of people's experience um, and with the institutions that govern voting and, and govern just kind of our uh, the effect of government in our daily lives, too. So. Um, one of the things that I think a lot of folks who work in civic tech wrestle with as well is that, you know, a lot of the things that make government uninteresting to people on a daily basis are requisite complexity in our system that exists for a reason. So laws shouldn't change very quickly and be responsive to the vicissitudes of public will because that could be really dangerous for a country to be dramatically changing laws for child adoption or economic policy on a regular basis, which is something we wrestle with, right? Because we know as like people build products, things move very quickly, but government doesn't always. So, uh, Adam, you mentioned something that was interesting. You, you kind of touched a little bit on social media and like how that affects things. And as a lot of us are aware, Facebook has been running a get out the vote campaign to get people to register, right? I think they run a four day targeted campaign every September in an election year. And they do all, also things outside of that. And they obviously champion that there are huge results for that. And I think uh, there was a New York Times article published two days ago that talked about some of the results. I know many of you have read it. And I think it said something to the effect of 129,000 people had registered to vote in California, I think in the past like couple days during the Facebook campaign. And that was like one of the highest days that California had ever had, which Facebook can obviously say like, that was us for sure. Do you think that was them? And if it was, why did it work or why not? I mean, I can tell you that on election day, my Facebook feed is absolutely filled with people telling you that they voted. People yeah. are proud to get out there and brag about the fact that they're civically engaged, which I don't know if that was true maybe 10 or 20 years ago. Yeah. But it probably was. You still see people wearing stickers. People are excited to get civically engaged if we make it easier for them. I know we're gonna talk about voter ID laws yeah. later on, so we can talk about that then. But um, yeah, I definitely think that giving people a way to kind of show that they're involved is a way to stimulate civic engagement. Why do you think that works so well? Because it gives them a stake in the game. Personally, I know I'm gonna sound a little biased because we do payment processing. I think having everybody contribute would be even more of uh, an impetus to get people to vote. Like a, for college basketball, for example, millions more people watch the March Madness NCAA tourney than they'll watch the regular Pac-10 game. That's because everybody put $10 down on their, on their bracket. So if you had more people contributing five, seven, ten $10 to candidates, you'd have so many more people showing up at the ballot box, in my opinion. Like ice bucket challenge meet political campaign. <laughs> um, no, I thought that was spot on what Adam was saying. Um, I think it's really interesting. I read that same article as well. Um, you know, I just say, you know, boo you, keep going, Facebook. You know, whatever, 
whatever does that trick to get more people registered to vote, um, you know, because it's, it's a complex stew, right? It's candidates, which is my big thing, getting more people to run and that stuff. But it's, you know, you, you can't vote until you register, so I'm all for it. I think as far as Facebook taking credit for all of that, um, you know, the, the analytics person in me has, struggles with the work that I've been doing most recently because I've been working on a coalition that's trying to build this surround sound effect of encouragement towards, um, you know, civic engagement and voting. Uh, but, but how do you measure that? How do you measure uh, the decision-making process of each of your individual users? Obviously, you can measure in impressions and clicks, uh, but at the end of the day, I think as a society, it's a good problem to have that we can't narrow down exactly who registered so many people, just that all those people were registered, so. That's a great point. Um, so this is gonna sound slightly misanthropic, so bear with me for a second, but I've been building consumer products my entire life, and one of the things that I find that works most effectively when building things for people is quite frankly playing to their vanity, or one of the seven deadly sins, and I think a lot of very successful social media startups leverage one of them very well, and vanity tends to be one of them. An I voted sticker that gets put on my Facebook profile helps my personal brand, it makes me look intellectual, it makes me look engaged and less irresponsible. And that's something that I think people in civic tech don't really think about too much because, quite frankly, they're there because we believe. We believe in like the system, we believe in the importance of democracy. We don't really think about vanity as a key driver for furthering like American politics, but it happens, right? I mean, it's, it's kind of something that's somewhat difficult to get away from. So that kind of is an interesting thing. Said by another name, it's called social proofing, which is something that UX designers use on a regular basis. And social proofing is using other people saying something looks like a good idea to impress upon other people who aren't as familiar with it that it must be a good idea. So Glenn Beck gets on TV and says, this is the best brand of butter. And his followers who are big Glenn Beck acolytes go, well, it's gotta be good butter because Glenn Beck says so, that's social proofing. And we see that in politics. You were mentioning that before. Have you all seen other situations where like social proofing has been used? Do candidates use it? Obviously, we see it with celebrities quite a bit to some effect. I think the president's definitely doing it a fair amount with uh, Senator Clinton, Secretary yeah. Clinton, at this point. Yeah, how so? Um, he has a huge following. He has that coalition that could put together a successful presidency or a successful candidacy for, uh, for Senator Clinton. So I feel like he's um, he's putting out the necessary messaging out there to, you know, to get her in a good place. That's good. When Chance the Rapper tweeted about TurboVote uh, that drove almost 20,000 new registrations on our site in two days. So yeah, major key. Michelle Obama's been no slouch as well, right? Like she's <laughs> been really been out there doing her fair share of social proofing for Senator Clinton. Oh yeah, I mean it's incredibly effective, and if you're interested in learning more about it, there's an article of five major, I think it's something titled like Five Major Types of Social Proofing, it's on a uh, blog site called TechCrunch, to lay out mm. how that works, if you're unfamiliar with the term, but it's something to be very aware of, because it does affect a lot of behavior. Uh, so a lot of you have been very involved with campaigns, obviously Nation Builder powers a ton of campaigns in a lot of different ways. Um, what are some, so in, in the kind of the first Obama campaign, one of the things we heard about earlier was that A-B testing and big data analytics played a huge role. And that was a big runaway takeaway of that campaign cycle. And then this campaign cycle, Bernie Sanders has raised a tremendous amount of campaign from small, or campaign dollars from small donors and through text messages, like SMS type stuff. Mm -hmm. What technology are you all seeing now that you're excited about or you think is changing the landscape or how people run? Well, Other than your own tools. Right. <laughs> well, Theoretical. Um, uh, yeah, I, my answer, for this, I, I thought about this question um, a lot. Hustle is the app, I think, that Bernie used. Yeah. Um, and I just think any technology, the, the two most important things about a new technology for me are increasing accessibility or increasing efficiency. If you can do one or both of those things, um, I will use your product uh, because I'm obsessed with those two things. So I think Hustle increased the efficiency of you know, raising awareness for Bernie Sanders' campaign in a, in a really huge way. Um, and as far as accessibility and increasing that, uh, I'm always a really big fan of what the Center for Technology and Civic Life is working on. So if you're interested in that, they are trying to modernize how local governments uh, uh, interact with their constituents. So that would be my. I'm I'm excited for James Hall's thing, um, open campaign. Like I'm, mm. you know, I don't have anything top of my head. 
uh, that I'm thinking about like for this current campaign, but that's a good product. I'm excited to see how that goes. I think it'll be interesting to see how political campaigns adopt AI and personalization, which is being used a fair amount now in the e-commerce space. It'll be interesting to see if in the next election when we go to a candidate's page, they're instantly going to show us a picture of what a, whatever issue we like on Facebook. So it has a real potential to, to increase the personal connection between a candidate and a potential voter if they know exactly what the voter is into and what they're wanting to see when they come to their website. It's kind of creepy, but I think it's something that's pretty exciting and effective, potentially. You know, it's interesting. I was, um, I was at a conference in, uh, outside of Spokane, Washington, not too long ago, and there were, it was a campaign tech conference. There were a lot of people who ran most state, federal level campaigns, in some cases, presidential campaigns. And one interesting thing is that we talked a lot about Facebook, we talked a lot about Twitter, we talked a lot about the use of different platforms, but they obviously have very specific purposes, especially for a campaign, right? What you would use Twitter for is very different than what you would use Facebook for. How would you all kind of characterize the purpose of these tools and how they fit into a campaign today? Like, what would you use Snapchat for? Uh, I think one, one really great thing about Snapchat in my personal life is that Every morning I wake up and my mom has Snapchatted me the inspirational quote from her desk calendar every day, never fails. She snaps no one else, only me. And I just like, I think that that's a way for you to emotionally be present in a place where you're not physically present. Um, and that's in my mom's office in the morning across the country in Florida. So I think that translates into campaigns in a way that we've seen the internet interact with a lot of movements. like. Um, Black Lives Matter, the Occupy movement, uh, Bernie Bros, a lot of different movements that have taken place in Ferguson, Baltimore, um, Charlotte. So, you know, a way to be present. So in how that translates into a campaign for me is like, if I can just see the hype at a rally, um, you know, even if it's not being posted by a candidate, just like seeing that hype and seeing what what's going on, you know, seeing a funny sign in the background, it's like this experience that you can get really quickly and and without actually having to go, like if you can't go. Um, so I think that's, as far as Snapchat and like Facebook Live, I think, you know, Facebook Live is such a strange thing because uh, I, I was scrolling through the other day, October 1st actually, and BuzzFeed had posted a Facebook Live video of a pumpkin in a corner and the caption was, watch this pumpkin rot. And it was like something like 400,000 people watching a pumpkin rot. So I don't know. I don't know how that translates, but yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of noise. And didn't we hear work for Facebook? Are there any vendors in the room? No, so Facebook won't tell you this, but they're also artificially pumping up video in everyone's news feed. Anytime Facebook Live goes up, they automatically give it a heavier weight in their algorithm so more people see it. And they won't tell you that because that doesn't help them at all, but their goal is to get you to consume more video content because they can monetize it at a better rate, to higher CPMs, and all that good stuff. So, like, campaigns are using it constantly now, too, because of that reason. Yeah, I mean, you know, I would have to say, Alex, like all of the above, right? Like I'm interested in everything that takes money away from TV because I think TV ads are so outdated and between who's actually going through the commercials and they're so expensive. So I've been fascinated with this since um, since Brat B. Cantor and he was so, um, you know, uh, just, it was a 23 to 1 margin between what Cantor had in the bank and, and Brat. And so I've been interested in, in watching these uh, shoestring campaigns and the way they use social media in all its forms, whether it's uh, Snapchat. I, I like, I'm a hardcore Democrat, but I, I wanna see what Donald Trump tweets. It's interesting, you know, it's ridiculous and everything else, but that, that uh, Vince had at lunch made some great comments on that and Facebook Live, of course. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. Uh, I met a bunch of the uh, Trump campaign folks at the RNC when I was there this year and one of the things that I was, I kind of like casually pitched them on, which ended up almost happening, which was very weird because I would have almost worked for the Trump campaign at that point, which would have been something I had not intended in any world. But effectively, I said, why doesn't Donald Trump just live stream his reactions to everything the DNC? Right, so the DNC, everyone's up there like giving their speeches and Donald Trump gets up there and goes, loser, what an idiot, what a slob, this and that. I guarantee you, as like morally bankrupt as some of that may have been, it would have been very entertaining and people would have watched it. Yeah. And the opportunity to like subvert someone else's dominant message using platforms like live stream content, 
It's never been, it's never been around before. It's pretty crazy stuff. Glad he didn't do it. He ended up choosing to do a Reddit <laughs> AMA instead, but uh, yeah, yeah. it's close, very, very close on there. Um, so uh, one other thing I wanted to, to kind of ask is, so we talked a little about Facebook, we talked a little about Snapchat. Um, one of the things that concerns me, has anyone here watched South Park? Is anyone a South Park fan? Okay, good. Last season, if you don't watch it, one of the dominant threads was like, ads are taking over the world, they're becoming more smart, and eventually ads become the singularity, and they are sentient and can think for themselves, <laughs> and then run all of humanity. And one of the interesting like last episodes of the season was there was like a humanoid person who was an, an ad, but didn't even know it because it's that incredibly complex. But today, a lot of the content that you see, especially in an election cycle, which our current election cycle, I don't know if you know, has been going on for 35 years. Like, it's just been going and going and going. So much of the content we get is paid content, yeah. is place content, is oppo research content from another campaign. And we touched on this a little bit about lunch, but how much of our content today that we're getting is like real, organic content? How, how, how much of it's like oppo research or non-organic or paid placement? How do we even know? I think that's the key. How do we even really know? I'll turn it, I'll tune in to CNN after a debate and watch the whole post game, right? And then I'll find out at the end that every single person's a surrogate of some campaign. So what was I even watching for? I, I know how they're gonna feel about the candidates who pay them. And I feel like we see that a lot on, uh, on online ads. And it's even tougher in the campaign finance space where if you're creative, you can figure out ways to um, put disclaimer information that won't really disclose who your, can or your contributors are. So. Definitely tricky. It is tricky. I mean, and it's tricky whether it's a campaign or not. If you subscribe to the New York Times website, um, right below the fold, like there's sponsored content. It looks totally like articles. So it's ubiquitous as far as the uh, paid content trying to pass off as news. Yeah. That's I mean, it's dramatically changing the content that we get, which then changes our perception of reality and changes like the, the direction of the electorate, right? And it's playing such an insanely large role because there's a lot of very brilliant campaign consultants out there who are very good at targeting you. And one of the things that kind of comes off of it, I'm interested to hear everyone's opinion on this. So it was at another campaign tech conference, the one I mentioned before, and there were kind of the new guard and there were the old guard. There were the new guard, which were like the <coughs> snot-nosed kids like myself, like overtly casual and bearded, and like big fans of Facebook and Snapchat and Twitter. And then there's folks that have been doing campaigns since before any of us could actually walk. And have been doing it successfully and seeing very good results with things like direct mail. And they, there was almost like this war in the room between saying, like, yeah, you know, all that Facebook stuff is great, and yes, you can definitely target them. But as far as driving like intentful traffic that's going to convert and take a real offline action, nothing beats like direct mail. Nothing beats like door to door talking to people. What's your thoughts on that? Like, how does it split? When uh, I think, I think a lot of that um, translates into voter registration, or some of it can translate into actual voter registration. We see in in-person events, um, paper is still king. Paper registration forms, so you can still get the best results from an in-person voter registration drive with paper form, paper forms, rather than go to turbovote.org and register. And that hurts my soul, you know. <laughs> but but it's the reality, and I think. Um, yeah, so that translates into my work in, in that way. Yeah. So paper's going to be around for a little while? Yeah, I think, and I think, you know, we were discussing in the first panel the voter guides and 30%, the 30% of folks who don't have that smartphone, a uh, way to engage with those voter guides, and what are we going to do? Well, we're going to keep sending them the voter guides for now. I think that, you know, we're in that election cycle where it is old guard versus new guard. Um, was it Roanoke? Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, so yeah, there's that old guard, new guard thing, that tension that's going on regarding uh, politics. Um, it's it's interesting. I mean, they've got to hire young people to do their digital, but at the top, it's an old guy like Roger Ailes making the, the, the calls. So um, I don't know. I, I think like next cycle, 2020, it'll be much more in digital's favor. I've been disappointed, and I guess a poor predictor, because I've been predicting digital will be a bigger part of campaigns for you know, six or eight years, and they're not yet. Um, so the, the young are still being fended off. Yeah, I'm, from my perspective, just to add to what you both said, is I think it's pretty clear 
if you look at how much it costs to do a TV ad buy versus just social media videos, it's an incredible advantage. And if you can target those videos to, you know, a single mom whose favorite movie is Casablanca, to who lives in Iowa, that's pretty unbelievable. I don't know if that's something you could do with traditional um, political advertising. So I think it's pretty clear which one's going to be more effective in the future. And I think what's more effective right now. Yeah. That's really interesting. I mean, I don't think so. I um, I also help a couple different campaigns uh, and. One of the interesting things I, don't, I think most campaign directors don't understand is the fundamental difference between Facebook ads and SEM, like paid search or PPC campaigns. Like you get on Google, right? So search someone's name and the top result comes up, that's a PPC campaign. So on Facebook, I'm finding someone who likely matches the psychographic or demographic target of an audience that I'm looking for. Soccer mom who does this and likes this. A army vet who does this and likes this. Facebook's very good at finding those people but they're not intentful traffic because you are passively finding people who meet that, meet that criteria. With PPC or SEM campaigns, people are actively searching for a specific thing. So it's like donate to Gary Johnson's campaign, Johnson Wealth. Well, that person's already searching for it, they chance, chances are they really wanna do it, right? They really wanna take that action. So finding intentful audiences is almost as important, if not more important, than like the tool that ends up converting them at the end of the day. So finding those audiences is like consistently a challenge. And a lot of you have like web-based tools where you're trying to like get at those audiences. I mean, what things have you seen particularly effective in finding intentful folks who like really are likely to take that action you're looking for? I work with the voter file a lot, the national voter file. Um, so at Nation Builder, that's one of the things that we provide. And I am just fascinated by the way the campaigns use them. I mean, we don't tweak them much. But they've, you know, when someone work or a customer of ours, they get the voter file for what they're asking for. And the data that they append to it is what I'm most interested in. Uh, there's a ton of interesting stuff you could do with the voter file. Everything from, you know, cross-referencing Facebook checks to looking at Zillow to look at their house worth. I mean, there's just really fascinating things. Uh, so, you know, the ads is one thing and the platform you're using for that. But the other super interesting part is the targeting for people and our ability to do, uh, to do that now. And that keeps on increasing. Every time you make a comment uh, that's saved on the internet, I mean, those are the pieces that we figure out who you are. When you make a donation to something, all that stuff gets, gets pulled into big data. And yeah. So we figure out the, uh, whether to send you uh, campaign ad A or campaign ad B. Yeah, so you know <laughs> that I'm a registered X or whatever, that my house is worth X number of dollars. Yeah. And, like, I'm likely to do these things or like these things, click on this content. Know your age. Know my age. Terrifying. How many, how many, how many um, elections you voted in? So that's really important for Trump because he wants to go after, uh, he's trying to attract a lot of uh, infrequent voters. Yeah. So he's just all about the voter file. It's really interesting. Mm -hmm. And for us, it's, it's pretty easy because all of our clients are bringing us on so that they could get contributions via their Twitter accounts. So they already have this audience. Like in the case of Brian Cranston, he has millions of followers. We're interested in what he has to say and what he wants to fundraise for. So for us, we have a, we have a pretty easy avenue. Same thing, California Democratic Party, tons of followers. They, if you're following them on Twitter, you're obviously somewhat interested in what they're, um, they stand for and what they're um, looking to get done. So uh, obviously a lot of you have tools, all of you have tools that are heavily used by millennials. Nation Builder obviously powers a ton of tools to do that as well. And a lot has been said in this election cycle about how millennials have a fundamentally different expectation of politics and relationship with politics than you know, preceding generations. How would you characterize kind of millennials' relationship with politics, especially in relation to like a presidential election relative to maybe their parents or somebody else? Well, we've seen from public polling and some, some data that millennials are deeply civic uh, through volunteering. Um, we've seen some pretty major movements come out of the millennial generation, like the ones I was mentioning before. Um, and I think, you know, also from public polling and some of that data, we see that millennials um, either entered the workforce or graduated college and then entered the workforce during the Great Recession. Um, so they've, they've engaged with government affecting their day-to-day -day lives in a largely negative way so far in their, in their political lives. And I think that has 
uh, that has an effect on the trust of government and the way that millennials choose to uh, engage civically. And I think civic engagement has also become this giant net that we can cast over so many different activities. Um, and it's really grown into this, this economy, so to speak. Um, so I think, you know, I, I think that millennials engage in a different way um, as far as like how we define impact how we use storytelling to show the impact we're having. And, you know, I don't, I don't know if voting, especially at the presidential level, has encouraged millennials enough that that does have an impact for them. So, yeah. I'm interested in the, I'm not a millennial, I'm 42, so I'm a Generation Xer. But uh, millennials are, you know, when I think about millennials, I think about the striking difference between Hillary and Bernie and the attraction for the millennial vote, uh, as well as how many, how scared the Democrats are of uh, Johnson and Jill Stein pulling uh, millennials. Uh, so obviously they're, you know, they're acting much better to online campaigns and there seems to be, they're very much into authenticity. I mean, you know, Bernie, if he's anything, he's an authentic person and Trump, whether we like him or not, is uh, usually passes the authenticity test. Yeah, seems like there's a lot of people who are very, very excited about that in the audience that was hearing murmurings. <laughs> awesome. So I wanted to give everyone in the audience a chance to ask questions. Um, we've obviously had a pretty far-reaching discussion about campaign tech tools and social, so feel free to hit anything. Yeah. 